Chapter 50 Involves a Serious Catastrophe The little race-course at Hampton was in the full tide and height of its gaiety, the day as dazzling as day could be, the sun high in the cloudless sky, and shining in its fullest splendour. Every gaudy colour that fluttered in the air from carriage-seat and garish tent-top shone out in its gaudiest hues. Old dingy flags grew new again, faded gilding was reburnished, stained rotten canvas looked a snowy white, the very beggar's rags were freshened up, and sentiment quite forgot its charity in its fervent admiration of poverty so picturesque. It was one of those scenes of life and animation, caught in its very brightest and freshest moments, which can scarcely fail to please. For if the eye be tired of show and glare, or the ear be weary with a ceaseless round of noise, the one may repose, turn almost where it will, on eager, happy, and expectant faces, and the other deaden all consciousness of more annoying sounds in those of mirth and exhilaration. Even the sunburnt faces of gipsy children, half-naked though they be, suggest a drop of comfort. It is a pleasant thing to see that the sun has been there, to know that the air and light are on them every day, to feel that they are children, and lead children's lives, that if their pillows be damp, it is with the dews of heaven, and not with tears, that the limbs of their girls are free, and that they are not crippled by distortions, imposing an unnatural and horrible penance upon their sex, that their lives are spent from day to day, at least among the waving trees, and not in the midst of dreadful engines which make young children old before they know what childhood is, and give them the exhaustion and infirmity of age, without, like age, the privilege to die. God send that old nursery tales were true, and that gypsies stole such children by the score. The great race of the day had just been run, and the close lines of people on either side of the course, suddenly breaking up and pouring into it, imparted a new liveliness to the scene, which was again all busy movement. Some hurried eagerly to catch a glimpse of the winning horse, others darted to and fro, searching no less eagerly for the carriages they had left in quest of better stations. Here a little knot gathered round a pea and thimble table to watch the plucking of some unhappy greenhorn, and there another proprietor with his confederates in various disguises, one man in spectacles, another with an eyeglass and a stylish hat, a third dressed as a farmer well-to-do in the world, with his top-coat over his arm and his flash-notes in a large leathern pocket-book, and all with heavy-handled whips to represent most innocent country fellows who had trotted there on horseback sought by loud and noisy talk and pretended play to entrap some unwary customer, while the gentlemen confederates, of more villainous aspect still, in clean linen and good clothes, betrayed their close interest in the concern by the anxious furtive glance they cast on all newcomers. These would be hanging on the outskirts of a wide circle of people assembled round some itinerant juggler, opposed in his turn by a noisy band of music, or the classic game of Ring the Bull, while ventriloquists holding dialogues with wooden dolls, and fortune-telling women smothering the cries of real babies, divided with them, and many more, the general attention of the company. Drinking tents were full, glasses began to clink in carriages, hampers to be unpacked, tempting provisions to be set forth, knives and forks to rattle, champagne corks to fly, eyes to brighten that were not dull before, and pickpockets to count their gains during the last heat. The attention so recently strained on one object of interest was now divided among a hundred, and look where you would, there was a motley assemblage of feasting, laughing, talking, begging, gambling, and mummery. Of the gambling booths there was a plentiful show, flourishing in all the splendour of carpeted ground, striped hangings, crimson cloth, pinnacled roofs, geranium pots, and livery servants. There were the strangers' clubhouse, the Athenium clubhouse, the Hampton Clubhouse, the St. James's Clubhouse, and half a mile of clubhouses to play in, and there were Rouge et Noir, French Hazard, and other games to play at. It is into one of these booths that our story takes its way. Fitted up with three tables for the purposes of play, and crowded with players and onlookers, it was, although the largest place of the kind upon the course, intensely hot, notwithstanding that a portion of the canvas roof was rolled back to admit more air, and there were two doors for a free passage in and out. 
excepting one or two men who, each with a long roll of half-crowns, chequered with a few stray sovereigns in his left hand, staked their money at every roll of the ball with a business-like sedateness, which showed that they were used to it, and had been playing all day, and most probably all the day before. There was no very distinctive character about the players, who were chiefly young men, apparently attracted by curiosity, or staking small sums as part of the amusement of the day, with no very great interest in winning or losing. There were two persons present, however, who, as peculiarly good specimens of a class, deserve a passing notice. Of these, one was a man of six or eight and fifty, who sat on a chair near one of the entrances of the booth, with his hands folded on the top of his stick, and his chin appearing above them. He was a tall, fat, long-bodied man, buttoned up to the throat in a light green coat, which made his body look still longer than it was. He wore besides drab breeches and gaiters, a white neckerchief, and a broad-brimmed white hat. Amid all the buzzing noises of the games, and the perpetual passing in and out of the people, he seemed perfectly calm and abstracted, without the smallest particle of excitement in his composition. He exhibited no indication of weariness, nor, to a casual observer, of interest either. There he sat, quite still and collected. Sometimes, but very rarely, he nodded to some passing face, or beckoned to a waiter to obey a call from one of the tables. The next instant he subsided into his old state. He might have been some profoundly deaf old gentleman who had come in to take a rest, or he might have been patiently waiting for a friend, without the least consciousness of anybody's presence, or fixed in a trance, or under the influence of opium. People turned round and looked at him. He made no gesture, caught nobody's eye, let them pass away, and others come on and be succeeded by others, and took no notice. When he did move, it seemed wonderful how he could have seen anything to occasion it, and so in truth it was. But there was not a face that passed in or out which this man failed to see, not a gesture at any one of the three tables that was lost upon him, not a word spoken by the bankers but reached his ear, not a winner or loser he could not have marked and he was the proprietor of the place. The other presided over the rouge et noir table. He was probably some ten years younger, and was a plump, paunchy, sturdy-looking fellow, with his underlip a little pursed, from a habit of counting money inwardly as he paid it, but with no decidedly bad expression in his face, which was rather an honest and jolly one than otherwise. He wore no coat, the weather being hot, and stood behind the table with a huge mound of crowns and half-crowns before him, and a cash-box for notes. This game was constantly playing. Perhaps twenty people would be staking at the same time. This man had to roll the ball, to watch the stakes as they were laid down, to gather them off the colour which lost, to pay those who won, to do it all with the utmost dispatch, to roll the ball again, and to keep this game perpetually alive. He did it all with a rapidity absolutely marvellous never hesitating, never making a mistake, never stopping, and never ceasing to repeat such unconnected phrases as the following, which, partly from habit, and partly to have something appropriate and business-like to say, he constantly poured out, with the same monotonous emphasis, and in nearly the same order, all day long. "'Rouge and or from Paris. Gentlemen, make your game and bet your own opinions. Any time while the ball rolls. Rouge and or from Paris, gentlemen. It's a French game, gentlemen. I brought it over myself. I did indeed. Rouge and or from Paris. Black wins. Black. Stop a minute, sir, and I'll pay you directly. Two there, half a pound there, three there, and one there. Gentlemen, the balls are rolling. Any time, sir, while the ball rolls. The beauty of this game is that you can double your stakes or put down your money gentlemen, any time while the ball rolls. Black again, black wins. I never saw such a thing. I never did in all my life. Upon my word, I never did. If any gentleman had been backing the black in the last five minutes, he must have won five and forty pound in four rolls of the ball. He must indeed. Gentlemen, we've port, sherry, cigars, a most excellent champagne. Here, waiter, bring a bottle of champagne, and let's have a dozen or fifteen cigars here. And let's be comfortable, gentlemen, and bring some clean glasses glasses. Any time while the ball rolls. I lost one hundred and thirty-seven pound yesterday, gentlemen, at one roll of the ball. I did indeed. How do you do, sir? Recognising some knowing gentleman without any halt or change of voice, and giving a wink so slight that it seems an accident. 
"'Will you take a glass of sherry, sir? Here, waiter! Bring a clean glass, and hand the sherry to this gentleman, and hand it round, will you, waiter? This is the rouge nor from Paris, gentlemen, any time while the ball rolls. Gentlemen, make your game, and back your own opinions. It's the rouge nor from Paris, quite a new game. I brought it over myself, I did indeed. Gentlemen, the ball's a rolling. This officer was busily plying his vocation when half a dozen persons sauntered through the booth, to whom, but without stopping either in his speech or work, he bowed respectfully, at the same time directing by a look the attention of a man beside him to the tallest figure in the group, in recognition of whom the proprietor pulled off his hat. This was Sir Mulberry Hawk, with whom were his friend and pupil, and a small train of gentlemanly dressed men of characters more doubtful than obscure. The proprietor, in a low voice, bade Sir Mulberry good day. Sir Mulberry, in the same tone, bade the proprietor go to the devil, and turned to speak with his friends. There was evidently an irritable consciousness about him that he was an object of curiosity, on this first occasion of showing himself in public after the accident that had befallen him, and it was easy to perceive that he appeared on the race-course that day more in the hope of meeting with a great many people who knew him and so getting over as much as possible of the annoyance at once than with any purpose of enjoying the sport there yet remained a slight scar upon his face and whenever he was recognised as he was almost every minute by people sauntering in and out he made a restless effort to conceal it with his glove showing how keenly he felt the disgrace he had undergone "'Ah, oh, Hawk!' said one very sprucely dressed personage in a new market coat, a choice neckerchief, and all other accessories of the most unexceptionable kind. "'How do you do, old fellow?' This was a rival trainer of young noblemen and gentlemen, and the person of all others whom Sir Mulberry most hated and dreaded to meet. They shook hands with excessive cordiality. "'And how are you now, old fellow, hey?' "'Quite well, quite well,' said Sir Mulberry. "'That's right,' said the other. "'Howdy do, very soft. He's a little pulled down, our friend here. Rather out of condition still, eh?' It should be observed that the gentleman had very white teeth, and that when there was no excuse for laughing, he generally finished with the same monosyllable which he uttered so as to display them. "'He's in very good condition. There's nothing the matter with him,' said the young man carelessly. "'Upon my soul, I am glad to hear it,' rejoined the other. "'Have you just returned from Brussels?' "'We only reached town late last night,' said Lord Frederick. Sir Mulberry turned away to speak to one of his own party, and feigned not to hear. "'Now, upon my life—' said the friend, affecting to speak in a whisper. "'It's an uncommonly bold and game thing in Hawk to show himself so soon. I say it advisedly, as a vast deal of courage in it. You see, he has just rusticated long enough to excite curiosity, and not long enough for men to have forgotten that deuced unpleasant— <laughs> By the by, you know the rights of the affair, of course. Why did you never give those confounded papers the lie?' I seldom read the papers, but I looked in the papers for that, and may I be— Look in the papers, interrupted Sir Mulberry, turning suddenly round. Tomorrow. No. Next day. Will you? Upon my life, my dear fellow, I seldom or never read the papers, said the other, shrugging his shoulders. But I will, at your recommendation. What shall I look for? Good day said Sir Mulberry, turning abruptly on his heel, and drawing his pupil with him. Falling again into the loitering, careless pace at which they had entered, they lounged out, arm in arm. "'I won't give him a case of murder to read,' muttered Sir Mulberry, with an oath. "'But it shall be something very near it, if whipcord cuts and bludgeons bruise.' His companion said nothing but there was something in his manner which galled Sir Mulberry to add, with nearly as much ferocity as if his friend had been Nicholas himself, "'I sent Jenkins to old Nickleby before eight o'clock this morning. He's a staunch one. He was back with me before the messenger. I had it all from him in the first five minutes. I know where this hound is to be met with, time and place both. But there's no need to talk. Tomorrow we'll soon be here.' "'And what's to be done to-morrow?' 
inquired Lord Frederick. Sir Mulberry Hawk honoured him with an angry glance, but condescended to return no verbal answer to this inquiry. Both walked sullenly on, as though their thoughts were busily occupied, until they were quite clear of the crowd, and almost alone, when Sir Mulberry wheeled round to return. "'Stop!' said his companion. "'I want to speak to you in earnest. Don't turn back. Let us walk here a few minutes.' "'What have you to say to me that you could not say yonder as well as here?' returned his mentor, disengaging his arm. "'Hawk!' rejoined the other. "'Tell me. I must know.' "'Must know?' interrupted the other disdainfully. <laughs> "'Go on. If you must know, of course there's no escape for me. Must know.' "'Must ask, then.' returned Lord Frederick, and must press you for a plain and straightforward answer. Is what you have just said only a mere whim of the moment, occasioned by your being out of humour and irritated? Or is it your serious intention, and one that you have actually contemplated? Why, don't you remember what passed on the subject one night, when I was laid up with a broken limb? said Sir Mulberry, with a sneer. Perfectly well. "'Then take that for an answer in the devil's name,' replied Sir Mulberry, "'and ask me for no other.' Such was the ascendancy he had acquired over his dupe, and such the latter's general habit of submission, that for the moment the young man seemed half afraid to pursue the subject. He soon overcame this feeling, however, if it had restrained him at all, and retorted angrily, "'If I remember what passed at the time you speak of, I expressed a strong opinion on this subject, and said that, with my knowledge or consent, you never should do what you threaten now.' "'Will you prevent me?' asked Sir Mulberry, with a laugh. "'Yes, yeah, if I can,' returned the other promptly. "'A very proper saving clause, that last.' said Sir Mulberry, and one you stand in need of. Oh, look to your own business, and leave me to look to mine. This is mine, retorted Lord Frederick. I make it mine. I will make it mine. It's mine already. I am more compromised than I should be, as it is. Do as you please, and what you please for yourself— said Sir Mulberry, affecting an easy good humour. "'Surely that must content you. Do nothing for me, at all. I advise no man to interfere in proceedings that I choose to take. I am sure you know me better than to do so. The fact is, I see you mean to offer me advice. It is well meant, I have no doubt, but I reject it. Now, if you please, we will return to the carriage. I find no entertainment here, but quite the reverse.' If we prolong this conversation, we might quarrel, which would be no proof of wisdom in either you or me. With this rejoinder, and waiting for no further discussion, Sir Mulberry Hawk yawned, and very leisurely turned back. There was not a little tact and knowledge of the young lord's disposition in this mode of treating him. Sir Mulberry clearly saw that if his dominion were to last, it must be established now. He knew that the moment he became violent, the young man would become violent too. He had many times been unable to strengthen his influence when any circumstance had occurred to weaken it, by adopting this cool and laconic style, and he trusted to it now, with very little doubt of its entire success. But while he did this, and wore the most careless and indifferent deportment that his practised arts enabled him to assume, he inwardly resolved not only to visit all the mortification of being compelled to suppress his feelings, with additional severity upon Nicholas, but also to make the young lord pay dearly for it, one day, in some shape or other. So long as he had been a passive instrument in his hands, Sir Mulberry had regarded him with no other feeling than contempt. But now that he presumed to avow opinions in opposition to his, and even to turn upon him with a lofty tone and an air of superiority, he began to hate him conscious that, in the vilest and most worthless sense of the term, he was dependent upon the weak young lord. Sir Mulberry could the less brook humiliation at his hands, and when he began to dislike him, he measured his dislike, as men often do, by the extent of the injuries he had inflicted upon its object. 
When it is remembered that Sir Mulberry Hawk had plundered, duped, deceived, and fooled his pupil in every possible way, it will not be wondered at that, beginning to hate him, he began to hate him cordially. On the other hand, the young lord having thought, which he very seldom did about anything, and seriously, too, upon the affair with Nicholas, and the circumstances which led to it, had arrived at a manly and honest conclusion. Sir Mulberry's coarse and insulting behaviour on the occasion in question had produced a deep impression on his mind, a strong suspicion of his having led him on to pursue Miss Nickleby for purposes of his own, had been lurking there for some time. He was really ashamed of his share in the transaction, and deeply mortified by the misgiving that he had been gulled. He had had sufficient leisure to reflect upon these things during their late retirement, and at times when his careless and indolent nature would permit, had availed himself of the opportunity. Slight circumstances, too, had occurred to increase his suspicion. It wanted but a very slight circumstance to kindle his wrath against Sir Mulberry. This, his disdainful and insolent tone in their recent conversation, the only one they had held upon the subject since the period to which Sir Mulberry referred, effected. Thus they rejoined their friends, each with causes of dislike against the other rankling in his breast, and the young man haunted, besides, with thoughts of the vindictive retaliation which was threatened against Nicholas, and the determination to prevent it by some strong step, if possible. But this was not all. Sir Mulberry, conceiving that he had silenced him effectually, could not suppress his triumph, or forbear from following up what he conceived to be his advantage. Mr. Pike was there, and Mr. Pluck was there, and Colonel Chowser, and other gentlemen of the same cast, and it was a great point for Sir Mulberry to show them that he had not lost his influence. At first the young lord contented himself with a silent determination to take measures for withdrawing himself from the connection immediately. By degrees he grew more angry, and was exasperated by jests and familiarities which, a few hours before, would have been a source of amusement to him. This did not serve him for, at such bantering or retort as suited the company, he was no match for Sir Mulberry. Still, no violent rupture took place. They returned to town, Messrs. Pike and Pluck and other gentlemen frequently protesting on the way thither that Sir Mulberry had never been in such tip-top spirits in all his life. They dined together sumptuously. The wine flowed freely, as indeed it had done all day. Sir Mulberry drank to recompense himself for his recent abstinence, the young lord, to drown his indignation, and the remainder of the party, because the wine was of the best, and they had nothing to pay. It was nearly midnight when they rushed out, wild, burning with wine, their blood boiling and their brains on fire, to the gaming-table. Here they encountered another party, mad like themselves. The excitement of play, hot rooms, and glaring lights, was not calculated to allay the fever of the time. In that giddy whirl of noise and confusion, the men were delirious. Who thought of money, ruin, or the morrow, in the savage intoxication of the moment? More wine was called for, glass after glass was drained, their parched and scalding mouths were cracked with thirst. Down poured the wine like oil on blazing fire, and still the riot went on. The debauchery gained its height. Glasses were dashed upon the floor by hands that could not carry them to lips. Oaths were shouted out by lips which could scarcely form the words to vent them in. Drunken losers cursed and roared, some mounted on the tables, waving bottles above their heads, and bidding defiance to the rest. Some danced, some sang, some tore the cards and raved. Tumult and frenzy reigned supreme, when a noise arose that drowned all others, and two men, seizing each other by the throat, struggled into the middle of the room. A dozen voices, until now unheard, called aloud to part them. Those who had kept themselves cool to win, and who earned their living in such scenes, threw themselves upon the combatants, and, forcing them asunder, dragged them some space apart. "'Let me go!' cried Sir Mulberry, in a thick, hoarse voice. "'He struck me! Do you hear? I say, he struck me! Have I a friend here? Who is this?' Westwood, do you hear me say he struck me? I hear, I hear, replied one of those who held him. Come away for tonight. I will not, by God, he replied. A dozen men about us saw the blow. Tomorrow will be ample time, 
said the friend. "'It will not be ample time,' cried Sir Mulberry. "'Tonight, at once, here.' His passion was so great that he could not articulate, but stood clenching his fist, tearing his hair, and stamping upon the ground. "'What is this, my lord?' said one of those who surrounded him. "'Have blows passed?' "'One blow has,' was the panting reply. "'I struck him. I proclaim it to all here. I struck him, and he knows why. I say with him, let this quarrel be adjusted now. Captain Adams,' said the young lord, looking hurriedly about him, and addressing one of those who had interposed, "'let me speak with you, I beg.' The person addressed stepped forward and taking the young man's arm, they retired together, followed shortly afterwards by Sir Mulberry and his friend. It was a profligate haunt of the worst repute, and not a place in which such an affair was likely to awaken any sympathy for either party, or to call forth any further remonstrance or interposition. Elsewhere its further progress would have been instantly prevented, and time allowed for sober and cool reflection. But not there. Disturbed in their orgies, the party broke up, some reeled away with looks of tipsy gravity, others withdrew noisily, discussing what had just occurred. The gentlemen of honour who lived upon their winnings remarked to each other, as they went out, that Hawk was a good shot, and those who had been most noisy fell fast asleep upon the sofas, and thought no more about it. Meanwhile, the two seconds, as they may be called now, after a long conference, each with his principal, met together in another room. Both utterly heartless— both men about town, both thoroughly initiated in its worst vices, both deeply in debt, both fallen from some higher estate, both addicted to every depravity for which society can find some genteel name, and plead its most depraving conventionalities as an excuse. They were naturally gentlemen of most unblemished honour themselves, and of great nicety concerning the honour of other people. These two gentlemen were unusually cheerful just now for the affair was pretty certain to make some noise, and could scarcely fail to enhance their reputations. "'This is an awkward affair, Adams,' said Mr. Westwood, drawing himself up. "'Very,' returned the captain. "'A blow has been struck, and there is but one course, of course.' "'No apology, I suppose,' said Mr. Westwood. "'Not a syllable, sir, from my man, if we talk till doomsday,' returned the captain. The original cause of dispute, I understand, was some girl or other, to whom your principal applied certain terms, which Lord Frederick, defending the girl, repelled. But this led to a long recrimination upon a great many sore subjects, charges, and counter-charges. Sir Mulberry was sarcastic, Lord Frederick was excited, and struck him in the heat of provocation, and under circumstances of great aggravation. That blow, unless there is full retraction on the part of Sir Mulberry, Lord Frederick is ready to justify. "'There is no more to be said,' returned the other. "'but to settle the hour and the place of meeting. "'It's a responsibility, but there is a strong feeling to have it over. "'Do you object to say at sunrise?' "'Sharp work,' replied the captain, referring to his watch. "'However, as this seems to have been a long time, "'breeding and negotiation is only a waste of words, no. "'Something may possibly be said out of doors, "'after what passed in the other room, "'which renders it desirable that we should be off without delay "'and quite clear of town,' said Mr. Westwood. "'What do you say to one of the meadows opposite Twickenham, by the riverside?' The captain saw no objection. "'Shall we join the company in the avenue of trees, which leads from Petersham to Ham House, and settle the exact spot when we arrive there?' said Mr. Westwood. To this the captain also assented. After a few other preliminaries, equally brief, and having settled the road each party should take to avoid suspicion, they separated. "'We shall just have comfortable time, my lord,' said the captain, when he had communicated the arrangements, to call at my rooms for a case of pistols, and then jog coolly down. If you will allow me to dismiss your servant, who will take my cab, for yours, perhaps, might be recognised. What a contrast, when they reached the street, to the scene they had just left! It was already daybreak, for the flaring yellow light within was substituted the clear, bright, glorious morning, for a hot, close atmosphere, tainted with the smell of expiring lamps, and reeking with the steams of riot and dissipation, the free, fresh, wholesome air. But to the fevered head on which that cool air blew, it seemed to come laden with remorse for time misspent and countless opportunities neglected. With throbbing veins and burning skin, eyes wild and heavy, thoughts hurried and disordered, 
He felt as though the light were a reproach, and shrunk involuntarily from the day as if he were some foul and hideous thing. "'Shivering?' said the captain. "'You are cold?' "'Rather.' "'It does strike cool, coming out of those hot rooms. Wrap that cloak about you. So, so, now we're off.' They rattled through the quiet streets, made their call at the captain's lodgings, cleared the town, and emerged upon the open road without hindrance or molestation. Fields, trees, gardens, hedges, everything looked very beautiful. The young man scarcely seemed to have noticed them before, though he had passed the same objects a thousand times. There was a peace and serenity upon them all, strangely at variance with the bewilderment and confusion of his own half-sobered thoughts, and yet impressive and welcome. He had no fear upon his mind, but, as he looked about him, he had less anger, and though all old delusions relative to his worthless late companion were now cleared away, he rather wished he had never known him, and thought of its having come to this. The past night, the day before, and many other days and nights beside, all mingled themselves up in one unintelligible and senseless whirl. He could not separate the transactions of one time from those of another. Now the noise of the wheels resolved itself into some wild tune, in which he could recognise scraps of airs he knew. Now there was nothing in his ears but a stunning and bewildering sound, like rushing water. But his companion rallied him on being so silent, and they talked and laughed boisterously. When they stopped, he was a little surprised to find himself in the act of smoking, but on reflection he remembered when and where he had taken the cigar. They stopped at the avenue gate and alighted leaving the carriage to the care of the servant, who was a smart fellow, and nearly as well accustomed to such proceedings as his master. Sir Mulberry and his friend were already there. All four walked in profound silence up the aisle of stately elm-trees, which, meeting far above their heads, formed a long green perspective of Gothic arches, terminating like some old ruin in the open sky. After a pause and brief conference between the seconds, they at length turned to the right, and taking a track across a little meadow, passed Ham House, and came into some fields beyond. In one of these they stopped. The ground was measured, some usual forms gone through, the two principals were placed front to front at the distance agreed upon, and Sir Mulberry turned his face towards his young adversary for the first time. He was very pale, his eyes were bloodshot, his dress disordered, and his hair dishevelled. For the face, it expressed nothing but violent and evil passions. He shaded his eyes with his hand, gazed at his opponent steadfastly for a few moments, and then, taking the weapon which was tendered to him, bent his eyes upon that, and looked up no more, until the word was given, when he instantly fired. The two shots were fired, as nearly as possible, at the same instant. In that instant, the young lord turned his head sharply round, fixed upon his adversary a ghastly stare, and without a groan or stagger, fell down dead. "'He's gone,' cried Westwood, who with the other second had run up to the body and fallen on one knee beside it. "'His blood on his own head,' said Sir Mulberry. "'He brought this upon himself, and forced it upon me.' Um, "'Captain Adams,' cried Westwood hastily, "'I call you to witness that this was fairly done.' Hawk, we have not a moment to lose. We must leave this place immediately, push for Brighton, and cross to France with all speed. This has been a bad business, and may be worse, if we delay a moment. Adams, consult your own safety, and don't remain here, the living before the dead. Good-bye. With these words he seized Sir Mulberry by the arm, and hurried him away. Captain Adams, only pausing to convince himself beyond all question of the fatal result, sped off in the same direction to concert measures with his servant for removing the body and securing his own safety likewise. So died Lord Frederick Verisoft, by the hand which he had loaded with gifts, and clasped a thousand times, by the act of him, but for whom, and others like him, he might have lived a happy man, and died with children's faces round his bed. The sun came proudly up in all his majesty. The noble river ran its winding course, the leaves quivered and rustled in the air, the birds poured their cheerful songs from every tree, the short-lived butterfly fluttered its little wings, all the light and life of day came on, and, amidst it all, and pressing down the grass whose every blade bore twenty tiny lives, lay the dead man, with his stark and rigid face turned upwards to the sky. 
End of chapter 50